Hi, I'm Roland Roberts, 2024 presidential candidate running the president of the United States as an American. You know, as I travel the country and we have meetings and, and, and get to meet all kinds of wonderful people, people ask questions. And sometimes they come to us through social media and sometimes, you know, most oftentimes in person. And so many of them are great, profound questions that the media just isn't asking. And so our team has collected some of these questions of the most pressing issues that voters are concerned with. And so I just wanted to take a moment with you and, and answer those, uh, what the Roberts presidency would look like in answer to these. Uh, the most vital issues that face your family, your future, your finances uh, today. So we'll get started. The first question, how would you improve national security and safety as of today? You know, it's a great question because there's several layers to this. There is the, you have to stop the bleeding at the border, and then you have to fix the legal and illegal immigration, uh, and you have to then separate the illegal immigrants of the last couple of years who came predominantly from nations that support terror versus all of the illegal immigrants who come from nations that are allies and that have been friends to the United States and that there is not a problem. Uh, you have to make that distinction. All illegal immigrants are not in the same category and in terms of solving the problem and addressing the problem. And until America fixes our legal immigration process, illegal immigration will continue to be encouraged. So we have to fix the legal immigration, the illegal immigration of the past, illegal immigrants that are already here, that are already going to our schools, that are friends with your children, uh, and that they're playing on the same soccer teams together and having them over for birthday parties. We have to solve that differently than we solved the illegal immigrants that were coming from nations that intend to do us harm over the last couple of years. And then, of course, obviously sealing the border so that this doesn't continue happening. Uh, even the right solutions for legal and illegal immigrants cannot be properly executed without stopping the bleeding at the border. It must stop. And it's it's for our safety now, with all of the over 100,000 fentanyl deaths a year, uh, killing Americans far more than COVID and some of the things that we were willing to shut down our whole economy and stop the wheels of commerce for. Uh, and we have a much greater crisis that we're just turning a blind eye to right now. Uh, but that's just the immediate. The greater long term is the fear factor. The fear factor is what happened on 9-11, when they strike fear into the hearts of every single American. And the truth is, we had have had millions come across, uh, many of which have had nefarious intentions at some point to be activated and to be mobilized by their uh, cells that are in a higher hierarchy than they are. And, and, and so we know that that is an imminent threat. And the way they do it is not through fentanyl and drugs. It is in the most casual way of everyday life so as to strike at the heart, strike with the greatest amount of fear to paralyze the American people. And there are so many of them now that the attacks will be far more coordinated than they ever were on 9-11. It won't just be happening in New York City or in one set of buildings or in one city block. With this amount of coordination and staff already in the United States that they have, they are able to carry out highly coordinated, simultaneous attacks so that the United States doesn't know where it's going to come from next. Americans will be boarded up in their homes. And, and we think it can't happen here, but we've already laid the groundwork for it to happen here. So that's one aspect to national security and how I will uh, keep Americans safe immediately. But that's only one part because we still have the ones who are here. Uh, we still have mass shootings. The school shootings and mass shootings at like sporting events and at uh, music festivals and at retail outlets and shopping malls and schools. This is the spark and the catalyst for so much of the rhetoric and, uh, and the, 
the heated rhetoric between uh, over guns and but how i will keep americans safe from these mass shootings my solution is not to go after guns just like i'm not going to go after automobiles there are far more automobiles uh, or far more guns in the in the united states than automobiles by a multiple and so but on but more people are killed with vehicles every year multiples even though there are few of them so on a per capita or on a percentage basis automobiles are one of the most deadly things in america and no one is calling for us to stop the automobile uh some would argue that that's the the net net of the electric car movement uh because they have the kill switches and so forth uh mandatory as of 2026 so they will be able to to, to stop that as well uh as they keep taking more freedom uh to control us more but that's what I will be stopping. Uh, I will protect you, your family, and this nation. Because, and how I do that, especially from the mass shootings, is without exception, every single one of our mass shooters have been on certain uh, medication. And we know what these mind-altering drugs are. Most often, they've been prescribed to them. Uh, they weren't high on something else. They were taking medicinal a medication, and it is mind-altering and puts them in states that you and I cannot imagine. You combine that with the ideology that is targeting our youth today, and that is what activates and mobilizes them. Uh, that is up to parents to guard their children on the ideology. I don't want it to be a purveyor in society and culture, but parents are the first line of defense to protect the minds and hearts of their children. And so while they're doing their job, I will be doing mine as president to make sure that we have the list of every single person that has been issued these mind-altering drugs in the United States. Most of them have been on FBI watch lists as well. The problem is they're not getting watched. And so part of my mandates will be realigning the, the uh, whatever federal Bureau, I end up assigning this task to, uh, to watching what they're supposed to be watching. Watch the watch list. Someone needs to keep eyes on them. And when they are crossing uh, uh, barriers and thresholds that are leading to the wrong thing, we know what the online activity is. We know the threats that are being made. And if we, we have to take preemptive action to get them mental help. Uh, the problem is we did away with uh, mental, uh, long-term mental health institutions years ago, several decades ago. Uh, and when we took away the mental health institutions in the late 80s, uh, we, it put them on the street. And then they ended up in prison. And so literally 33% of the, our current inmates probably belong in a mental health institution to get the help they need, as opposed to in, the, in, in a caged environment where there is no help, there is no solution long-term. And, and so we must fix that. That is the greatest safety that I can do uh, and that we can do as, the, as Americans to protect our children in schools, to protect concert goers and sports fans, and for you to just be able to go out on the weekends with your family and go shopping and get what you need, buy Christmas supplies and, and enjoy Thanksgiving and be able to buy school supplies without fear of some whack job coming in and blowing the place up. And so these are the immediate steps that I would take to keep America safe. These are real steps. Uh, these are not partisan steps. These are not talking points from any political party. This is common sense American ideas of how do we stop the mass shootings and, uh, and then how do we protect our border? These are different types of assaults. These are different types of threats. And the president of the United States better be able to handle all of them. And I haven't even started to talk about how I handle your cyber cybersecurity. Your phones are compromised. Your laptops are compromised. Your TVs are compromised. Your smart devices are compromised. And it's only going to get exponentially worse with artificial intelligence. And we have political leaders and presidential candidates who can't even say the word and couldn't give you a definition of it if they tried. Ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the top three greatest issues of our day and of our time is national security. 
And the family and the breakdown of the family is one of the greatest contributing factors to the threat of our safety than anything else. But the great news is it's also the answer. The stronger the family unit is, the less teenager is going to need to have be on some kind of mental health, mind-altering drug. The less they're going to need some antidepressant, the less which causes more people to commit suicide than if they almost even weren't on it. It's it's such a difficult situation to be in. But a strong family alleviates most of that. Uh, doing what's right, uh, having a wholesome family, those are the kind of things that uh, teaching your children values and honor and respect and decency. These are the that's the substance of what creates a valuable citizen, a contributing member of society that is safe, that is uh, helps protect the vulnerable and the weak and the poor. Uh, and that is a healthy, that's a healthy nation. And so those are, those are just a few highlights on how I would keep America safe. Second question and topic. What will an educational, an ideal educational pathway of a student in 2026 look like? An ideal educational pathway of a student in 2026. The ideal pathway is going to be bachelor's degrees and vocational schools running concurrently with high school. Let's back up for just a moment. The Department of Education is a new failed experiment of the last 44 years, okay? It's not like it's always been around and, and we're just trying to, to alter things now. That is the failed experiment, not what the substance that we know from history. From thousands of years, we know how to educate for a prosperous society. What we're doing today does not work. The answer is not more money. The answer is not even better trained teachers. The problem is it fundamentally has to be renewed. It has to be transformed. And so uh, starting even with the hours in which we go to school. Uh, we we take the first 18 years of every single American's life, and we have deemed that necessary. The, in times past, the Americans have given the federal government uh, the right to mandate that, uh, that all Americans must educate, be educated uh, and go to school. Uh, so we take the first 18 years. The problem is we have extended that another 10, 12 years with societal expectations and then with the great scam of the, the student loans and, and even really college in many respects. Look, it probably 15, 17 years ago when they started offering courses, bachelor's degrees in, in topics that there's never been a single job in, how in the world, why, what, what are you doing? That's, that's not preparing people for the future or to generate an income. You're not even helping the GDP of the United States. You're intentionally creating dependency, not independence. And that's what built this nation, uh, the ingenuity, the creativity, the innovation, the railroad, the trains, the steam engine, the airplanes, tr new transportation, manufacturing, the assembly line, automobiles. It it wasn't it, that th those innovations don't come from the way we're doing things today. And so the way it will look in 2026 with Roberts as president is we will have bachelor's degrees in vocational schools running concurrently with the high school years. Now, high school will be in the morning. The school day will likely be extended till 5 p.m. Uh, and then high school and then they would be going to school after that uh, in, in the afternoon to vocationally or uh, trades or their bachelor's degrees. And we'll have parameters that the bachelor's degrees have to be in subjects uh, you know, that uh, will serve the students in earning an income uh, that are known industries uh, and industries of the future, such as energy, artificial intelligence, physics, mathematics, engineering, uh, technology, uh, cybersecurity. You know, these are things that will be with us for the remainder of our life on planet Earth. And so we need to educate people our children and our youth in this area because they'll always be able to earn a living. Now, we also naturally would promote entrepreneurship because that puts the power in their hands. They don't, they're not beholden to a recruiter 
or to a, a, a boss somewhere who maybe they'll hire you if they like you or don't like you. In the entrepreneurship world, you get to pick yourself. You get to pick you. If you want to start the business, you get to start the business. If you've got an idea, you've got a product idea, you get to put it out in the marketplace and see if it's well-received or not. And if it's not, tweak it or abandon it and start again and, and take off with the next idea. And the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. And at some point, you'll find and be really in tune with what the market wants. And then you'll achieve great success. But the ideal 2026 school uh, with going to high school in the morning and going to college in the afternoon and extending that school day, do you understand how much that helps American families? Because right now, people talk about women pay inequality and things of that nature. Many of them choose not to take some of the higher paying jobs because there is a higher expectation that comes with those. They want you to put job first, not family first. They want you to put your career first. Uh, your your conference calls, your Zooms. They want you to put your work ahead of your family. And so many opt not to do that, uh, which means they end up earning less or can't aren't in the positions which they are capable of being in uh, because they chose to take a different path uh, and do a, a little bit of both. Well, by extending the school day till five, that adds several, a couple of hours where many moms and, and, and fathers who are the ones doing it are able to work guilt-free because their children are getting much better educated than what they're getting right now. And uh, they're able to take higher paying, better jobs that meet in uh, their skill set. So I think it solves a number of problems, both at home uh, and it solves the educational problem. But I'll tell you what else it solves. Teen pregnancy will dramatically decrease. Uh, teen drug use will dramatically decrease and teen suicide will dramatically decrease. Did you know the vast majority of teen pregnancy, teen drug use, and teen suicides happen between 2.30 and 5.30 p.m. until mom and dad, mom or dad get home? That is when this is happening. And it's just a structural problem in America. Yes, we have family breakdowns, but we are contributing to it just in the sheer nature of the timing of the school day and the workday. See, the workday used to end at three. So I understand why th where things used to be, but the workplace in commerce has evolved. School has not. It's very, very slow to transform in itself or reinvent itself, but it is past time. This is the answer for education. I appreciate all the teachers who well-meaningly go strike for more money or the, the unions that want more of this or that, uh, tools to educate in the classroom and so forth. I appreciate that. My mother uh, is a high school English teacher. My father is the administrator of a K-3 through 12 grade school and has been for decades. I understand this so much better than, than you think. I We know what America needs at this time. I understand the, the educational world. We started Roland College in Africa. Uh, we graduated 2,451 students last year. Uh, in the county of Vihiga County, which is the state of Vihiga in Kenya, it was the largest non-political gathering. Our graduation was the largest non-political gathering in their history. So I understand education. I understand where things are in the world right now and where they're going. And by the way, student loans, I'm not going to forgive your student loans. What I will do, is pay them off, negotiate them and pay them off. And we will use the endowments of the public universities to do it. Most of that was public funds that they kept taking our money that the federal government gave them, plus kept raising the rates on you because they knew we would backstop these with the federal loans. And so they were, they've been double dipping for so many years and then we'll take their dormitories, which are no longer necessary because we don't need to have all this duplication of college campuses because we're using our school buildings that we're already paying for once uh, with high schools. And, and then we'll be able to turn those dormitories into veterans housing and long-term mental health housing. This is how you solve America's problems, ladies and gentlemen, but it takes ingenuity. It takes creative thinking. These are not difficult things. These are proactive American things that will make your life and my life better. It lets your neighbors and those who are more vulnerable and worse off 
uh, than we are. It gives them the help and the resources that they need. It allows the places that you live to be cleaner and safer. It gives more opportunity for you and your children. Who can argue with healthy children? Who can argue with a bright, with bright students and a future uh, and a path forward that they can be confident in? Do you know why when most youth uh, are the most depressed? It's between the ages of 16 and 23. And studies show that it is because we are designed, we are designed to start being productive in those in those years. That's why m- many state laws allow people at either 15 or 16 years old to take a job. Uh, and then there's certain jobs that are obviously reserved for 18 and above. That is when we are innately designed to start really being productive. And when we hold that, when we rob our children of being productive and say, no, don't go be productive. Instead, go through this man-made little system we've made where you go to school for another, you know, cram six years uh, into a four-year de- four degree into six years and and then take a few years to travel the world and find yourself. And, and you're 28 and 30 years old. Now you've got to get the real job. And they are depressed because that is not what we are meant to do. And America has suffered for it. Everyone's having to talk about social security and the future of the the, the viability of funding social security. And they're having to talk about the future of Medicare and, and social services of all kinds. Well, we created the problem. And the problem is not to, the answer is not to cut that. The answer is to fix this. And that's what I will do as president. So that's how I see the education. By the way, when you add 12 more years of productivity per person in the United States, imagine how we will have every service we need fully funded. And we have healthy children that are not depressed because they are increasing during their best years. They're being productive and they're earning and they're they're growing in beautiful ways. We will have a renewal in America once again. Okay, third question. How can the United States avoid being trapped in the yearly returning one way, uh, having to fear that there will be a shutdown and public life will significantly negatively impact year in, year out? Okay, so I think the question is, how do we avoid a potential government uh, or potential shutdown every year because of a pandemic? Uh, or a government shutdown and things like that. What well, the government shutdown is completely different than a pandemic shutdown. Uh, if the, the government shutdowns, uh, you know, have happened several times, the most recent one and the longest one, ironically, under President Trump, uh, over 30 days, the government was shut down. And so, my question to you is uh, did you even know that? How much did your life change? See, it's one thing when the government shuts down because the critical services don't shut down. There's a fear element that those who pander to us try to strike with this narrative. No, we should not have government shutdowns. Yes, we need a functional, functioning government. However, the pandemic shutdowns were evil. I can tell you that we have not yet seen the damage that it did to our children. We have not yet seen all the extent of the vaccine injuries, the mask mandates, the isolation. It's still hard to believe that Americans in the United States of America allowed their grandmothers, their grandfathers, their mothers, and their dads to die while they're looking at them through a glass, or through a window. You would have had to put me in prison because I would have barged through every doctor and every nurse and every wall that tried to prevent me from being with my loved one on their deathbed as they are dying. I can tell you with Roland Roberts as president, you will at least have four years or eight years. 
and you will be able to breathe every day knowing that no matter how bad things get, the government will never restrain you, confine you to your own residence. There may be grave threats. There may be great danger, biological danger. There may be mass chaos in America. There may be natural disasters that are absolutely horrendous uh, and egregious in their destruction and devastation and loss of life. We could be invaded, and I still would not lock people in their homes. It is wrong on every level. In America, you are free to choose, by and large. Obviously, there are exceptions that Americans have conceded over the years. But you are responsible for your safety, first and foremost. You are responsible for your health, first and foremost. If the government was responsible for your health, then we would not have potato chips. We would not have soft drinks. We would not have fast food. We would not have half the things that uh, you use on a daily basis. Americans are uh, just second nature uh, in using. We wouldn't have such overly genetically modified foods that wreak havoc on our systems that why we need a pill to wake up and a pill to go to sleep and a pill to get moving and a pill to stop moving. And that it's, it's just, it, it's, it's crazy. But th that is the freedom you have in America to choose what path you're gonna take on your health. Well, it's also your freedom to choose how you're gonna protect yourself. And if there's biological issues, biological uh, weapons that have been deployed in the United States, viruses that have been unleashed upon us, uh, I'll be doing my part as president. But it is not our job to take away your freedom in the name of securing you. One of the greatest phrases I ever heard was, a bird in the cage is safe, but he is not free. See, I would rather you be free and fly to your nest when there's danger. When it's cold, fly south. When it's warm, fly north so you can enjoy great weather there. I mean, this is the way of freedom. And so there will not be any lockdowns. You would not have to worry about that at all. Next question, number four. Influence rises and falls on leadership. What important factors are leaders in our nations missing out on today? Well, you know, there's been several outstanding leaders in American history. When you study great American leaders, without exception, they were statesmen first. You know, most people can't tell you which party the greatest presidents were from. Because the greatest leaders are not Republican or Democrat. The greatest leaders are Americans. So I believe the greatest missing in our leaders today, and there's so many facetious things I can say here, but the greatest thing missing in our, the, the leaders of the United States of America today is the discernment, judgment, wisdom, and fear of the Lord. That is the greatest missing in our leaders. They do not have an understanding of the times in which they lead. They're leading as if they are in a simulation. They're leading as if they are in a game. They're leading as if uh, this is just an exercise and in, in, in doesn't have actual con uh, consequences. They're leading for the lifestyle, not for the future of America. They're leading to propel a party instead of lead the United States. I recently said in a press statement that I'm not willing to be the president of the United States by alienating 49.9% of the people and demonizing 49.9% of the people and stomping on 49.9% of the people and trashing verbally 49.9% of the people. I'm not willing to become the president that way. I'm not willing to do it. A President Roland Roberts, I want 70 to 80% of the United States of, of Americans to say, that's our president. I don't even agree with him. 
maybe half the time, most of the time, any of the time. I don't, but, but he's a good man. He's the man for America at this time. And we will have a better America, even though he's not my personal flavor and cup of tea. That is the scenario in which I want to be president of the United States. See, if I am president, but half the country hates me, can't stand me, and they don't even know me, uh, then, and by the way, they never hate usually the person. There are some that are despicable just because of who they are. But many of the presidents that are not memorable, they were hated because they were party presidents, not American presidents. And I vow to each one of you that I will be an American president. That means there will be times that all parties are not happy with some decision or another. But that what they can trust is that I will do right by America, our citizens, and the people and nations of the earth in the eyes of Almighty God. That much I can vow, and they can know. That way there's no funny business. They don't have to guess where I stand. They don't have to guess what the future is going to hold. The stability and peace, the peace of mind that that brings to people, to companies, to families, to the United States and the nations of the world, we, you, we can't even fathom how much better the closest thing to a utopia we will ever get is with that kind of leadership. So everything does rise and fall on leadership. I do believe that. And I believe that America is a reflection of her leaders today. But good news, America, there's an election coming up and we can change that. Question number five, you are stating that family is the second most important priority in your life after God. What does family have to do with the future success of the United States? What does family have to do with the future success of the United States? The strength of the family is the strength of the nation. What I mean is every nation throughout history, in, in the fall of the Roman Empire documents this well. Historians have documented it well, that it was the breakdown of the family that was one of the five greatest contributing factors to her decline. It cannot be ignored. It is a principle. It's a law of nature. So it's not something that we debate. It's just kind of, here's what it is. We can choose to do something about it or let it go and just go ahead and decline. Uh, I'm on the side of I want to do something about it and I want to fix it. And I believe that the fix starts with me. I believe that I have to have have my family life in order. I believe that we have to set an example. I don't believe I have to force my family values on anybody else. But I do believe I have to live them. I have to believe that I can set the example because I do believe everything rises and falls on leadership. You can't, it's not do as I say, don't do as I do. I've made the mistakes. I know how devastating uh, broken families are. I know what it does to the children. I know what it does to the parents. I, I know the pain that most people never ever heal from, no matter what they say, no matter what they post on social media, they wear it. It's in their face. It's in their wrinkles. It's in their bitterness. It's in their the, the, the edge that kind of comes on the tip of their words. It's, it's something that hardly ever leaves an individual. It's that destructive. And it wreaks havoc on a nation. It wreaks havoc on your, your commerce and your GDP. You know, it's interesting. Whenever I work with companies and I would go into a company, a CEO to turn it around or uh, work with them in some capacity. Most of the time I would go in and I'd be talking to the senior executives and whatever the business problem was we were trying to fix, I would go around and say, well, how would you solve it? How would you solve it? How would you solve it? And what I found without fail was that some of the best and brightest RD ideas, the way to solve the problem was already in the room. So what was preventing the, what was preventing it? Let me tell you, most of the business problems in America aren't business problems. There are personal problems of someone in leadership at that company. You heard me right. Many of the business problems, many of the, they, they blame it on the business environment, they blame it on the economy, they blame it on the stock market, they blame it on consumer uh, interest and, and consumer spending, they blame it on a whole lot of things. But you know why I never bought that? Because every time, take any industry, 
and the industry as a whole could be in a slump. But there was always a handful of companies in that same industry that were thriving, which means it can't be just because of this, because there are some that are doing great in spite of that. What I always found was it was actually personal problems, because when things aren't right at home, you're going to have a hard time making the best decisions at work. That's just the way life and family is, is, is made. That is the law of nature, recognizing the value of family. But when family is strong, when it is united, when it is wholesome and healthy, everyone in the family flourishes. The kids at school, the parents at work, the nation at large. I remember some people who uh, were raising chickens and and we were trying to separate their chickens from everybody else that was raising chickens. And, and we started talking about, well, what makes your chickens different? And they said, well, we feed them better food. Well, what, what good does that do? And well, their surroundings are nicer. My chickens aren't as stressed out. I said, okay, so you have, your chickens are happier. And so happier chickens produce better eggs. They taste better. They're just happy. That's not, they're not born out of stress. Uh, and that's the same way it is with families. You're not as creative. You're not as, as vibrant about life to have ideas and to be bold and to take action when things aren't right at home. So yes, family is important. And it's worth getting that right before you get your income right and before you get your job right and before you get anything else right. Get your home right. Get your family right. Have a close relationship with your children and your parents. Uh, and, and, and with your relatives, invest in family. It's worth it. And, and it's critical to the United States of America. By the way, we are the most independent nation on earth when it comes to family. And that's not a good thing. Uh, most cultures, the ones that have lasted thousands of years, not you know the one that's 247 years old, the cultures that have lasted thousands of years are the best at having close families. And they understand the danger of a lot of the Western philosophy of independence. It actually destroys wealth of a family because think about, think about it. Mom and dad buy a house, they work, you know, junior grows up, uh, goes to college, gets a job. He buys a house and two cars, mom and dad have a house and two cars. And then all the siblings have a house and two cars. Well, that's not the way most places do it because everybody has to have their own independence. But then you're, 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 you're taking money that could have been, if it was consolidated, you'd be able to have a multi-million dollar business. Instead, you're all just each trying to survive and barely pay the bills for your own house and your own cars and your own duplication of everything. Like no company would run that way. But yet we've somehow bought into the idea that that's how our families are supposed to run. It's a very bad economic model for you and for me, but it's great for those who want to control us. So yeah, family is important. We, we would not have uh, the incarceration rates that we have if there was a loving father and mother in the home. Uh, we would not have the drug use. Uh, we would not have the fentanyl use. We would not have the mental illness. We would not have the suicides. Ladies and gentlemen, we would not have the mass shootings that we have from, from, from young people who are confused if they had a strong mother and father and a loving home. We just wouldn't have, it would not be the same. Uh, and so, yes, I want to strengthen America's families, and I believe it is in our national security and our economic best interest to do so. Next question, number six. Living costs are on the rise, especially the price of energy. How can people in the future still afford to run their ACs or heat their homes when necessary? Well, let me say it's a good question. It's a real question. Uh, you know, in, in California, you can't even run your washing machine and your dishwasher at the same time. You know, where, where places that I live, you can. Uh, but I, even so, I see a reduction in, in uh, water pressure and I see other problems. Uh, there are times when you plug in something and it dims the lights somewhere else. Uh, we have an energy problem in the United States, but the energy problem is man-made. It is government-made. OK, uh, it is a government made problem, which means we can fix it uh, with the right leadership. And that should be important enough to all Americans. I, I hate that things have to get so bad before Americans really stand up and say enough is enough and put the right people in who just 
will do the right thing. Uh, but as it relates to your energy cost directly, let me tell you, the way we're doing it today is the absolute worst way. Even when we try to do it the right way, we do it the wrong way. So we try to do the right thing, but we do it the wrong way. So for example, nuclear energy is the cheapest energy that we could ever do that is long-term and sustainable, okay? We have we can build nuclear energy plants in the United States, super safe, the cleanest energy. It's wonderful energy, especially with the technology over the last 10, 12 years, really amazing energy that we need to, to uh, roll out throughout the United States. Uh, for example, the United States uses nuclear energy to power our submarines, to power our aircraft carriers. We fill up one time a new aircraft carrier and never again for, the, for its entire life. One time. And it's sailing the world. And submarines, same time, one time, last 25 years. Yes, that's how nuclear energy works. But you can imagine why certain other industries uh, in the energy sector don't want that because then you wouldn't be stopping at the gas station every two days to spend $100, okay? Uh, and But when it comes to your utility costs, clean coal, methane hydrates, did you know there are 9,000 years of methane hydrates in the ground today? Yes, that's right. My, in the United States alone, we don't need any other country for any of our energy. We shouldn't even just be talking about energy independence. We should be talking about energy dominance. We should be selling energy around the world. But like so many things, we haven't been leading the world. We haven't been leading our own nation, much less the world, in so many decades that it is profoundly sad because I believe in American spirit and in the American mind, the American ingenuity. I've seen what this world, this that this country has given to the world with innovation in the last 200 years. So uh, I do believe that uh, nuclear energy is the way. It's it's less than half of what all the current energy costs are. But here's, here's what I mean when I say, sometimes people do the right thing the wrong way. South Carolina, uh, under one of my competitors, ironically, uh, wanted to bring nuclear energy. Well, instead of bringing the best technology, they brought their lobbyist cohorts people that uh, there was a vested interest somewhere. And uh, and so they chose not the cheapest and the best option. They chose their cronies, gave them the contract. Well, the cronies, because this is how people work with states and, and federal governments, went over budget by almost double. So instead of costing you know, 19 or $20 billion, it cost 33 or $34 billion. Instead of taking 20 years, it, it, or, you know, it take, it's taking 35 years. And we haven't built a new nuclear reactor in, in nearly 40 years. And let me tell you, uh, the issue with that is that most of the parts on our nuclear is 40 years. It has a 40-year lifespan. So you know what the Department of Energy did? And it, because instead of shutting down all nuclear energy plants in America, which would have crippled us, instead, and instead of building new ones over the past 10, 20 years that they could have been doing, you know what they did? They actually just said, okay, now we're going to extend the, part, the, the, the life of each part by 20 years to give us time to keep figuring it out. That would be like me saying, okay, my car has 250,000 miles on it, but, uh, and I know that the parts are bad, but I'm going to arbitrarily assign that these parts are now no longer need to re be replaced after 250,000 miles. They're going to last for another 250,000 miles. What kind of loony bin are we living in with people running the country that way? But it's to cover up corruption, it's to cover up bad leadership, and it's to cover up uh, the fact that they just aren't as smart as they wish they were. So uh, there are solutions for the energy, but we must develop them. We have to start building yesterday. We have to start addressing these things now. Uh, it takes years to bring a nuclear reactor online, but yet as soon as you do, done the right way, your utility bills would be cut in half. So, and that's all over the country. And it's more sustainable and you're not going to have blackouts and rolling blackouts and all of the other pro uh, problems and nonsense. And it's more secure from a cybersecurity perspective. Let's talk about national security as it relates to this energy. My goodness, we have problems in America. They, Our systems are, our electric grid is vulnerable, but there is hope and there are solutions. And with Roland Roberts as president, I will solve them. May God bless each of you. May God bless these United States of America.